we'll start. I'm, I'm okay, very happy sure. to have you again. And uh, I'm really happy to be back talking with you again. Always you're always more than welcome. And we're going to start with Ibn Khaldun, a great uh, philosopher of history, great historian from uh, 14th century, and how he perceived North African societies and uh, the, the societal mechanisms of his days. Yes, yeah. So I think that there's been a long term interest in my discipline of anthropology in Ibn Khaldun and his his social thinking, because in some ways he seems to sort of preface the great sociologists of, of 19th century Europe. Of 19th uh, century, yeah, yeah. 18th century. You know, it, but he, in some ways, you know, he seemed to he seemed to preface uh, kind of uh, Montesquieu and and and, and yeah, of course. And he was ahead of his time. But I think that's. Yes, but at the same time, I think people often make him too far ahead of his time and forget that he was immersed in a very different time and a very different way of viewing the world, one where the supernatural and religion had a far greater role. Um, and, you know, ultimately, uh, the Muqaddimah doesn't set out a secular and materialist vision of reality. It sets out one which is, is, is fundamentally theological um, and also deeply mystical. Um, so I think sometimes he's been made to too too much to speak to modern concerns and modern interests, and he's sort of been dragged into uh, into modernity in 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 quite a crude way. But nonetheless, I think um, the the area where I'm really interested in um, in his sort of uh, his social vision is the way in which it influenced um, various social anthropologists um, and sociologists. Uh, to write and to think about um, Arab societies and civilization, um, and to use this to interpret even quite um, contemporary 20th century ethnographic case studies. Um, and uh, I, think, I think one of the main ways this, this came about was um, via the anthropological idea of segmentary lineage theory. And this is, this, this, this is a sort of idea for those who aren't particularly familiar with it, that, um, uh, in, in a sense, it's a solution to the problem of how a society without a political class, without um, or without uh, a clear centre, a central political unifying force, can still be conceived of as a society, which is a sort of question in, 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 in Durkheim and Weber. Um, and early anthropologists obviously were very interested in this, and, and particularly the East Africanist tradition, British anthropologists like... Um, uh, Evans Pritchard in particular became sort of um, particularly exercised by the questions of acephalous societies and acephalous political orders or uh, socio-political orders um, and whether you could even talk about politics in an acephalous society and the, the focus came to be on the idea of segmentation the sort of balanced opposition between equal elements um, and uh, through this, um, it, it kind of, the, the idea kind of um, seemed to become entangled with other ideas of tribalism, um, of uh, genealogy determining political outcomes and events, um, so that the way tribes will uh, um, sort of act in opposition or in cooperation with each other is determined by uh, certain readings of genealogy. Um, and, and a lot of this, was sort of summed up for these earlier anthropologists, um, in a sense, uh, the a certain idealized version of um, Arab tribes uh, came to stand as a kind of exemplar for this whole this whole world. Um, the, you know, the, the sort of the famous Arab phrase, phrase um, about um, my brother and uh, my brothers against my cousins, my brother and my cousins against the world sort of um, came, 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 I think, slightly wrongly to, to sort of be, be seen as an example of segmentation. But the idea was this was a sort of an external theoretical um, tool or, or method of analysis that was, was applied as a model to understand complex social realities in the Middle East. The other big one being the, the idea of the Middle East as mosaic, which you get in um, Carlton Kuhn's famous book, Caravan. And so the mosaic and the segmentary lineage triangle became the sort of the models to, to view the Middle East. Um, and, and rightly, these, these, these were 
pushed back against very strongly, um, particularly, you know, after um, the sort of writing culture turn in my discipline of anthropology, but more broadly, the sort of crisis over representation and Orientalism um, emerging from the work of Edward Said. Yeah. Um, so I think, I, so, so, so rightly there was a lot of pushback, but I think one, one area that has interested me a great deal is how um, Evans Pritchard's ideas, um, and later the other big proponents of this segmentary vision of society in the Middle East was uh, Ernest Gellner, who, who, who famously said that uh, characteristically the tribe is both an alternative to the state and also its image, its limitation and the seed of a new state, which is, which is actually almost a paraphrase of Ibn Khaldun, were in fact deeply influenced by certain Western readings of classical Arab social theory. And in particular, um, Evans Pritchard really, um, there's a chain, a sort of genealogical chain of connections back that e Evans Pritchard was taking the idea really from um, Robertson Smith, who was a, um, a, a, a um, professor of Arabic. And he in turn was interested in ideas of genealogy and um, sort of, Genealog genealogical binaries and, and, and oppositions, um, which, which went back a long, long, long way in, um, in classical Arab thought about the nature of uh, society and states through Ibn Khaldun and Al-Buni and others, um, but which took on a certain light through um, Western reinterpretation and reimagination. So I'm, I'm as a sort of side interest of mine, a side research project is trying to untangle this alternative genealogy of segmentary lineage, because I think while we might dispute its status as a theory, I mean, and we definitely should. I mean, it, it, it's not a good way of looking at, at, at Arab history at all. Um, it contains certain interesting points about um, sort of uh, the way people conceive of political identity, um, of uh, the motivations of things like reputation and honor, yeah. um, not personal attributes only, but attributes to do with a name and a place. Um, and, um, you know, I think the, the British anthropologist was in fact, briefly uh, my undergraduate tutor, Paul Dresch has this point of that segmentation uh, doesn't, uh, it can't be, can't really be used as a, as, a, as a tool for understanding the course events took or take but it can be considered to be a sort of structural force, a sort of a, um, a, a in a sense, something which um, affects the way the game is played and the way the game is thought of. And I find that interesting. And if we think about, um, so it's sort of in, in, in Khaldunian terms, um, you, you, you have the basic model of the, the state, you know, the dollar, um, which is a sort of conceived of uh, as uh, 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 a sort of cyclical model of power and politics that, um, you know, even, even within the Arabic term dawla, you have an idea that uh, a dynasty is like a turn. It's uh, um, a, a sort of something which is in flux, not a fixed, not a, a sort of uh, a permanent force. Um, you have the great agent of change, which people focus on in his work is Asabiya, the idea of um, something which is often interpreted as solidarity, but means something more like um, sort of uh, uh, an energy, which um, the energy and cohesiveness of um, a claimed political identity, a claim to solidarity, if you will. The, in a sense, it's, it's a measure for him of the efficacy of a claim to solidarity in, in, in a political, arena. Um, so we see his idea of uh, um, Asabiya um, declining follow, um, with, with uh, success, in a sense, that uh, um, within the state, um, dynasties which managed to capture uh, the urban state, the city, and its sources of power succumb to a period of um, uh, luxurious living following success to competing claims to selfishness to rivalry uh, and slowly fall apart while uh, at the periphery of the state um, particularly among nomad nomads nomadic, highland yeah, yeah, nomadic um, you have people who, who forge Pure, a new strong sense of 
put Asobie. the civic society against the nomadic groups. Mm. That's his so, concept. So, and, and, and eventually, do you think it's within outdated a cycle, or it's still working? Within a cycle of two hundred years, he, yeah. he he suggested that uh, a, a state would uh, would would succumb to uh, a sort of alternative state. But I think you know that's a, a very even Ibn Khaldun wasn't wasn't always very clear on how this social theory of cycla, cyc, sort of cyclical um, uh, movements of power worked in practice. In a sense, some of it has become almost uh, a common sense discourse of history. I mean, if you think about stuff like uh, world systems theory and the idea of core and periphery, yeah. um, and, and, and the way believe, that core Do you believe in cyclic uh, system or cyclic... Uh... I think I don't believe or not believe in it. I think it's 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 a perspective on history which can be useful. I think it's too simplified. Useful. It certainly it's, is. And it's more is very simplified. So, for instance, one of the ways you can see that even Ibn Khaldun was groping at the fact that it was too simplified is his uncertainty of how to treat Mamluk Egypt, because yeah. in some in some senses in the Muqaddimah, it, 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 it you know, and, and it, it's complicated by the fact that Ibn Khaldun was reliant on Mamluk patronage. Um, for his various appointments as a, a Maliki judge in in, in Cairo. Um, of so he may have been corrupted time. by Mamluk power. <laughs> well, yeah, and I mean, our ideal of the, the Muqaddimah is that um, Ibn Khaldun wrote it in, in sort of self-imposed exile in, in the reef in Algeria yeah. in this sort of desert, car, this sort of mountainous uh, setting far from people and, and, and you know, and he, and he did certainly spend a lot of his career working as a kind of uh, a patron and a, 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 an intermediary between government and tribes. But, um, you know, when, when, when dealing with uh, Mamluk Egypt at various times, he sees it as the perfection of the Asabiya system uh, because it's a place where um, the sort of Asabir is is renewed through the mechanism of um, you know the man the Mamluk elite is uh, self refreshing in a sense because it's non hereditary at least in True. theory at least at first True. and it involves new sort of people with strong Asabir being brought in from uh, Circassia and uh, and and the sort of Turkic Central Asia um, to to refill the sort of <laughs> the Asabir in a sense, but at other times he seems to think that Egypt is succumbing to the same, the same forces. At various times also he seems to suggest that Syria and Egypt are kind of beyond, unlike the Maghreb, are uh, outside of this sphere of kind of uh, the power of, of, of nomads, but he must have been aware that this was actually a time when the Arab tribes in, uh, in Syria were especially influential and important and there had been a sort of Bedouin polity of much of northern Syria. Ooh. And he was he, he was aware of these things. And I think his, his definitions, uh, one of the problems that I think um, people of uh, Western scholars have struggled with it, Ibn Khaldun is his, his, his definitions constantly shift. Um, at various points, you know, we see um, him define uh, uh, Badu, as, as much as we might define them in the in 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 sort of the, in, the, in the contemporary, you know, a, 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 an idea of uh, um, nomadic Arabic-speaking tribes claiming a kind of noble genealogical past um, or, or former nomads, um, but at other times he seems to use the term in a, in a very different sense, disparagingly, as almost anyone beyond a city's walls. Um, yeah, he was very anti. Uh urban population, he considered urban uh, people as, uh, he, as the core I think of he, uh, the generation. In the but way. at other times, you know, he, he also famously said that places that succumb to the Bedouin are quickly ruined. Um, and of in course. some ways, he, he, he has a kind of almost uh, uh, quite a gloomy view on, on the possibility of uh, progress and urban growth um, because he's, he, you know, he has a sort of, um, a, a belief that certainly the Maghreb, if not the entire world, was in a state of decline. He saw the 14th century yeah. as a, a period of decline. You know, I think that's that's partly to do with theological reasons that you yeah. know every generation since the Prophet has been worse than the preceding generation. But I think it was also partly, um, you know, a result that that he was living in a land of ruins there were ruins everywhere agriculture seemed to be declining population seemed to be declining he was living in um 
the aftermath of the Black Death. True. Um, he, you know, and 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 whether we want to, you know, there, there's a lot of debate about whether the uh, Bani Hillel invasions of Cyrenaica and the supposed sort of yeah. devastation of that area. Black like Death really was the major impact, impact of devastation of not only North mm. Africa or Levant, but uh, Europe. Yeah, and in the Levant, of course, he was living through, um, you know, a, a time where, um, you know, the Mongol, the Mongol threat was Mongol still very threat. real. So yeah. The uh, the Ilkhanate in, in, um, based in Persia it, it was still raiding. It was uh, only, you know, a hundred years since, uh, or, or less than a hundred years since the Battle of Ain Jalut. And, uh, you know, within his, his own, with Ibn, one of the most famous incidents in Ibn Khaldun's own life was his uh, meeting with uh, Timur uh, Tamerlane in, Tamerlan, in the West, yeah, outside, yeah, Tamerlan, yeah. Uh, outside of Damascus. You know, so it's, of he has this extraordinary uh, supposed <laughs> meeting with the world conqueror and a, a sort of discussion of history. But, um, and, 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 you know, that, that's all fascinating. But I think it, it's, it, we have to be very careful about um, making Ibn Khaldun a modern social historian or social theorist, because, you know, much of the Muqaddama is deeply uh, strange and mystical. I mean, um, you know, there's the large passages around letter magic and the use of the Zayaraja, et cetera. So I, 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 I and, you know, I, my research isn't so much to do with Ibn Khaldun per se. I'm interested yeah. in uh, anthropological interpretations of certain ideas of segmentation and of um, tribal political orders and the way that th those ideas, including ideas from classical Arab authors like Ibn Khaldun, have influenced uh, contemporary anthropological oh, understandings of non-state politics, really. Yeah. Yeah. How do you find the... Fragmentation in the UK. UK is not uh, a tribal society of uh, mm. Ibn Khaldun times or modern Middle Eastern uh, time. And we have, during pandemic, all kinds of societal uh, problems and all kinds of uh, fragmentations within the Western society. I personally don't think that uh, Western societies acted very well. I don't think that the state actors managed to handle this crisis uh, in an egalitarian way. And uh, from your perspective, mm. Yeah, you so, tell me how, how they handled the pandemic. <laughs> so I think uh, on a broader level, yeah, I mean, I think uh, there's been a big interest in, in, in all the social sciences and the idea that, um, I, and in some ways it's quite an urgent interest in, in the way that the, the pandemic can be seen as a kind of, um, uh, in a sense, a window onto and a litmus test for different societies and different exactly political for systems. the social um, fabric and how they work together precisely there was a very interesting um uh, uh, journal special issue which i'd recommend uh you know our our, our mutual friend jeffrey hughes wrote a, yeah. an interesting introduction about the situation in jordan for it specifically looking at different responses to uh to to covid19 around the world you know i think he, he draws attention you know in in, in jordan there's been um, a lot of people are calling Jordan's response the Chinese model, you know, and it's a sort of securitized model, which is possible in some ways because of Jordan's, um, you know, uh, strong focus on security and securitization um, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, leveraging um, sort of older infrastructures to do with uh, fighting um, insurgency. Um, and uh, dealing with squatter settlements, etc. So, I mean, I, I think he, he, he makes very interesting points. I think uh, on a broader sort of historical and, and social level, I think, you know, people have, there, there is a certain argument that we're, we're dealing with something a bit like, we, you know, we were talking earlier on together about Carl Schmitt and we're yeah. dealing with a sort of Carl Schmitt-like oh, state of exception, oh, right? Oh. And we see limits of liberalism and the limits of democracy. I'm I'm interested in that argument, but I'm a little skeptical of it because I think we'll 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 have to see in the long run whether autocracies 
are doing better than than liberal no, democracies. No, no. And I think we also have to consider yeah. whether if they are, that's because of their autocratic powers. I mean, it, it, it seems like uh, Bolsonaro and Modi haven't done especially well in dealing with the, the virus. Um, and, and, and as for uh, China and Russia, it's very difficult to know exactly what's gone on on the ground in many places because information is 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 so controlled and again you know i think there's this focus on on post-truth as though it's a novelty but in many societies uh you could argue there's never been a uh there's never been any it, it, it's not post-truth the truth truth has always been a dis a contested and a deeply politicized thing and 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 yeah. accurate um demographic and health information um is 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 not the sort of the norm which is has, has has been perverted during this crisis it's always been something which has been hidden politicized um and and controlled by by uh, the powerful you know and i think <laughs> i think people have been maybe it's it's a bit like how people have responded to the economic crisis and and the rise of the idea of precarity um, as yeah. though this is something new and shocking to do with the neoliberal order, but actually it's been the norm for most people for a long, a long time. Um, there's a sort of a, a, a myopic Western view of the world going on in a lot of this, I feel. In terms of Britain's own response, I mean, there, there have clearly been enormous problems. I, I, I work myself as a COVID tester and I'm also a community volunteer in my area. And it has been quite heartening seeing um, uh the sort of flowering of various community organizations that have looked out for each other on the grass level but at the same time it's been sort of discouraging how quickly that faded over the summer when things opened up and also how divisive the broader political ramifications um of the government's economic um interventions have been and you know if anything i thought this will finally put paid to old ideas of fiscal austerity as a useful economic idea but no people are still sort of saying there's no mag magic money tree you know even as we're we're borrowing at, at critically low levels um and uh, uh yeah very low level uh, historically un unbelievably low levels of interest yeah. and there doesn't seem to be any limit on what the state can borrow at the moment but um the thing that has concerned me most i think in the political response is uh the sort of conservative ideological knee-jerk reaction is that the private sector is best and only the private sector can really deal with a response. I myself am working um, not for the NHS to do this testing but for a firm called Sodexo which is in turn uh, contracted to do this work of testing for another firm, an old British firm called Boots which is now actually wow. owned by an international conglomeration which is in turn paid by the government and it's called NHS test and trade uh, track and uh, test uh, track and um sorry test and trace <laughs> but uh the nhs has actually been almost entirely excluded from this you know the nhs the national health service the state funded yeah. health service um and instead um all the power and the decision making has been given to um people from the private sector who've been brought in to manage this so that so originally this was managed by public health england uh, and now um it's managed by um test and trace and also um, the National Institute for Infectious Disease and these bodies are chaired by people who have no background in health or even or epidemiology or public health I mean we talk about this there's a sort of a lot of people who are concerned about the sort of dict dictatorship of the epidemiologists here but actually yeah. The people running the the the, the government response in, in the most important bit of the government response arguably which is testing and tracing tracing yeah. contacts are all from the private sector um so the head of test and trace is a very controversial figure called um baroness dido harding who um originally worked at mckinsey the international consultancy firm uh she um and and that's her background she's married uh, to the government's anti-corruption watchdog, uh, Sir John Penrose, who she met while okay. also working at McKinsey. Many of the board members are from McKinsey and the companies that they have chosen to contract to and which get these government contracts are almost invariably closely linked to McKinsey or to the Conservative Party. 
So you've seen this appalling exercise. Some kind of uh, conflict of interest. Enormously, but and, and, and I mean, it's 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 uh, it, it's for, for me. I find it very interesting because you know I have written a little bit about um, discourses of corruption in Jordan and Atif Trauna and exactly. um, the, the the cigarette scandal, etc. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And this is just the same thing, but you 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 it's don't at the same time litigation fear of litigation um, prevents the press from reporting this as robustly as they might. Yeah. Um, and also the government have this excuse of it was an emergency. We had to go with people quickly. We didn't have time to go through a tender contract. And so you almost the, the sort of Schmittian yeah. state of exception is, is used to cover up uh, an enormous transfer of funds to the private sector. And I mean, the problem with their model is that they assume that the private sector will deliver more efficient outcomes, despite a lack of expertise. You know, the expertise of these people at McKinsey, the main thing they do is they present PowerPoints, which explain why their ideas are good and why the McKinsey model will save you money. They don't have any expertise in delivering these sorts of things. But I mean, if you if you look at um, the company uh, Serco, which is, is is been contracted to do the largest sort of part of um, of, of testing in the UK, um, you know, they they uh, they their 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 contract. Their, their bid, sorry, to get the contract, um, set out that they could do it 20% less than the cost for the state to do it by the NHS. Um, and you think, okay, so they need to do it for 20% less than the state to be worthwhile uh, for the state to decide to go to a, a private rather than a public body to do this. And they need to, on top of that, make a profit to please their shareholders. That just doesn't work. You know, they, they need to make a profit and still cost less. So something is going to have to give. And the, and the way it's, it's, it's given, I'm afraid, is all sorts of small compromises, which fundamentally undermine the efficiency of, of testing. I mean, one thing I'm, I, I think is, you know, I mean, it, it, it's a very small example, but the government contract that uh, it, it employs me specifically yeah. involves um, that they were supposed to provide us with a uniform and winter clothing for, yeah. for doing testing and yeah. these have never arrived they've never arrived we're actually wearing our own clothing and it's of up course. to us to go home and wash them every night and you know we're coming in touch with the the live virus of course um and at the same time many of the people who who manage us who are on who have been seconded from boots their host organization have been made redundant um so you know, I think I think it's been a, a, a maddening example of how blind ideological faith in in in, yeah. in a flawed economic model. Um, liberal, liberal model, with, liberal. It's a, it's a liberal model because liberal think, model but, starts with these kinds of concepts. Absolutely, but crucially, combined this this sort of blind ideological faith is yeah. combined with, with really seeded sort of seedy self interest uh, and. and, and venal self-interest and I think the reason it's such blind adherence to the ideology is because the ideology is in perfect lockstep with self-interest and these people don't really want to deeply examine the underpinnings of their own uh, sort of worldly position which is understandable you know they um, no one no one wants to um, well very few people particularly fancy uh, a sort of uh, deep introspection, which leads them to, to to question whether they're really a success in the terms that they think they are. Um, but during this 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 pandemic, I think that has been for me a particularly unpleasant uh, example of kind of the limitations of liberal conservative uh, economic thinking, or neoliberal conservative economic yeah. thinking. You might say. Another one has been. Um, you know that we've gone back to this old idea of quantitative easing. The Bank of England is, is, is just announced another 150 billion of quantitative easing, which was shown during the financial uh, the financial crisis of 2008 to largely end up being um, benefiting uh, the rich because it, 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 it you know it, the mechanism is that um, the Bank of England buys government bonds, but not directly from the government. Uh -huh. uh, through the secondary bond market, so people who already hold bonds, and the people who hold bonds are hedge funds, uh, investors, pension funds, basically people who already have money. So you're you're in effect you're 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 
you're bank you're you're bankrolling the the elite and i think you know it, it, even in 2008 we had a campaign and you know the late anthropologist david graber was involved with this um for people's quantitative easing that rather than using this money to buy government bonds the government the, the bank of england should instead invest uh create money to it uh and spend it on big uh state infrastructure projects a sort of fdr yeah. new deal like people are still really reluctant to this they they you know the old it, it, and i think it comes out of this old sort of discursive nonsense that household economics uh sh sh the state economics should be like household economics mm -hmm. um that, you know there's no magic money money tree and the state needs to uh balance its books and i mean I certainly think that the claims of the sort of new monetary theorists are unproven and we don't really know what long term effects they would have on society, you know, just printing money to, to do whatever we want. Um, but I think actually, you know, in many ways at the moment, we're not having a proper experiment with those ideas. We're having the worst of both worlds. We're, we're neither having our cake <laughs> nor eating it. We're, we're having like uh, reckless fiscal spending uh, coupled with uh sort of uh nonsensical conservative ideology which means that the good that this enormous debt we're racking up could do is yeah. is 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 not trickling down widely enough in society we're trusting that it'll trickle down but in effect we're 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 giving money to the same old people that have always positioned themselves to receive the money um yeah so that that's my analysis of the sort of the the broader political problems that have being brought to the fore with um, with COVID nineteen in this country, um, I think there's a lot of other angles you could take. I'll on I'll give you another COVID angle. COVID. First of all, how COVID nineteen, with all kinds of lockdowns, all kinds of uh, separation, affected the ordinary people and the the social or or, or societal fabric. Mm. Mm. How it affected people in general in the UK because UK was very badly affected by COVID nineteen. Yes. Now we have yes. all kind. Now we have all kinds of lockdowns, and they're planning to not. They're planning. They, they shut down the the half of uh, small businesses and middle middle businesses. Uh, economically, yeah. COVID nineteen is a complete disaster. For for many countries, so absolutely, absolutely. I I don't believe that uh, it's a plot of three people. I don't think that Bill Gates is going to no. trip, trip individuals like some morons thinking. No, I I don't think we have to believe it's a yeah. plot or something planned in advance. Yeah, we don't have. I to. think you know, the people who are very the the. The rich and powerful and, and particularly certain billionaires and certain governments are intelligent enough and fast thinking enough to turn uh, something which is an unplanned disaster to their immediate advantage and i don't think we should find that surprising and i don't think we need to imagine that this was planned i think people have seen ways to use use covid19 to their advantage um but that's not the same as uh cons a conspiracy yeah um I mean, specifically on the social fabric question, as I said, on the ground, some things were quite encouraging, I felt, particularly where I live is a, a, a working class and or previously working class, increasingly gentrified, but uh, still very much labour supporting uh, suburb of Cambridge called Romsey. And we did have a lot of community engagement here, at least in the initial stages of lockdown, which was encouraging. There were a lot of volunteer groups. On a broader level, I think it's still too early I think to judge the, the 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 effects on on the sort of social effects, I think the polarization of debate has become really interesting um, and really worrying. Um, you know, actually, quite reasonable people have made incredibly strident anti-lockdown arguments. Um, the former um, UK uh, Supreme Court judge Jonathan Sumption is is particularly sort of strident in his belief that uh, lockdown is self-destructive. Um, and out of proportion. And I mean, certainly compared to earlier um, pandemics, uh, we'd have to admit that this is, uh, you know, enormously destructive on an individual level, but is, is you know, it, it, comparisons to 
the Spanish flu or even to uh, the polio epidemic in the 1950s are, are pretty well, overblown. We think how how many people perished from those in those pandemics, let alone well, the the Black Death, <laughs> um, which well, had a sort of 60 well, percent mortality rate for those infected. Um, yeah. And I think that, that has to be brought into account. But at the same time, you know, our society is very different and our expectations of what governments can and should do to protect us are enormously different to those even of, of, of 100 years ago or even 50 years ago. And our expectations for medical science are enormously different as well. And we don't really expect to be the vic as, as healthy people. We don't really, ex ex we no longer accept the inevitability of mortality from infectious diseases. We, yeah. we expect to die of degenerative diseases in, in old age instead. Um, I think I'm a bit concerned that the sort of generational side of this debate in the UK is becoming increasingly strident and gaining kind of traction that people are more and more you're hearing, um, you know, the, the, the sort of statistic, uh, statistics around the, uh, the fact that, you know, the, the average age of uh, uh, COVID fatalities is, um, is, is higher than the national life, the, the local life expectancy in various places around the UK, mm. which is, a, it's, is an interesting point, but it doesn't really deal with the, the fundamental fact and the reason why COVID is of such concern here, which is, you know, the, yeah. that hospitals can't cope and, and that if they lock down, many more people will die. At the same time, I think globally, and, and you know, the WHO have been saying this for some time now, we have to admit that lockdowns are immensely destructive and costly tools and there are better ways of running them which is why which, which sorry there are better ways of 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 of, of um of combating of dealing with the, the pandemic of course which is why i mean my frustration and and i think you know for some society so some countries um test and trace or even economic lockdown is an impossibility you know yeah there are the the places which have become sort of savaged by neoliberal economics you know in, in pakistan the um the government hasn't been able to seriously leverage borrowing so yeah. it, you know, its credit rating was bad before it, it's worse now and you know it, I, imran khan had to basically say there's very limited amount the government can do and that's that's the case in lots of places in britain i think the frustration is that so much money has been thrown at um alternatives to lockdown you know we had our contact tracing app which was launched um we've had enormous amounts spent on test and trace and yet the results haven't been impressive um and i think that's where a lot of the frustration comes from uh the sort of the broader social impacts uh i think are still anyone's guess to a certain degree um It'll be very interesting to see what happens because, you know, Britain's teetering on the edge of a no deal Brexit as well in come the new year, yeah. um, which I think we're getting a lot more attention uh, if it wasn't for for the pandemic and for the oh, lockdown. Yeah. Um, it'll be very interesting to see how how those uh, divisions um, sort of map onto new divisions created by lockdown. Certainly, the, the, the North-South division has been made um, a mm. lot more politicised anyway. I think culturally, it's, it, it's always been strong. And I think we're seeing, you know, in, in a way, it's made the difference between people who are able to successfully self-isolate and to live a kind of internalised uh, and self-sufficient life and those who aren't because they, they work precarious jobs where they can't take off take time off where they don't yeah. have large gardens or large houses all the more important and all the more obvious but how that maps on to broader political divisions uh is, is is still a bit up in the air i mean you know we've seen a lot of people who would traditionally be quite conservative uh initially very supportive of lockdown and strict uh um you know health preserving measures but at the mm. same time we've also seen the former brexit party um under Nigel Farage reposition itself as a sort of anti-lockdown party. You know, he's relaunched himself as Reform UK and uh, is now campaigning for an end to lockdown um, and for- But he's uh, not uh, an epidemiologist or, or virusologist. Uh, no, Nigel no. Farage is a typical demagogue, not the mm. populist, and, as I told and, you. Because you know, some it, populists it played a very positive role in the history well, demagogues are always uh, negative. It's so funny, isn't it? And to see figures like 
Michael, Michael Gove before Brexit famously yeah, yeah. said the line, the British people are tired of, are tired of experts. And now he's forced to parrot the government line of we're following the science, which is, you know, an, an enormous about face in sort of their, of course. their, their the you conservative party the kind of thing. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. for someone who's part of the social fabric in the UK, what do you think about uh, 2021 regarding uh, COVID-19? 2020 is gone. It happened what happened, but we have to look forward to 2021. Yes, yes. So I think um, it's very hard to know how many things will play out in 2021. And obviously it'll depend on various things like uh, the success or not of uh, vaccine approvals, particularly the Oxford vaccine. Yeah, yeah. Um, it depends a bit on whether uh, we find an acceptable way of doing mass uh, fast-acting testing, um, which AstraZeneca has been um, pushing hard for at great expense. And we've had a, a so far not particularly successful attempt at mass testing in Liverpool. Um, I think the the rest of the year, the the, the and 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 next year are largely going to be defined by the economic fallout. Um, yeah. I think we're almost certainly going to have a double dip recession and um i think we'll probably also see a, a big crash in house prices especially in london which will affect all sorts of global investors including sort of various figures from the gulf and from russia um who've invested in property in london um whether that leads as many would hope to a kind of um a slightly new economics um, and a move away from uh, London centrism and a, a, an obsession with financial services and the city uh, is anyone's guess really. My hope is it will, particularly coupled with uh, Brexit. And even if it's painful in the short term, um, it may open up space for a kind of um, a new, uh, new ideas to emerge about economics and about the future of, uh, of the UK. Um, the other big unknown, of course, is uh, uh, Scottish independence, which seems to be, yeah. uh, in some ways, to have been um, whipped back to life by uh, by um, the pandemic. You know, we we've we've seen a kind of breakdown in um, in relations between uh, the UK English, you know, the, the oh, government, course. the UK government, which directly controls health policy only for yeah. England. Um, and the Welsh, Scottish and Northern Irish um, sort of uh, um, devolved uh, um, public health bodies um, who've been advising their own devolved governments um, quite effectively. And this sort of localization um, and fracturing seems to be, uh, um, you know, something that's happened in many places, not just the UK. Mm -hmm. um, and it's interesting, you know, many people are saying that local responses to uh, the pandemic have been more effective than state led ones. Um, I think it's too early to say whether there's evidence to support that or not, really. Um, at least I haven't seen anything very convincing. I've seen a lot of people claiming, um, claiming the reverse as well. Um, but either way, I think the, the, the effects are, um, are important and, and will probably um, come to a head once we move beyond the immediate phase of um, of sort of uh, mass infection and death. Yeah. Um, and we'll probably see a big, big push towards Scottish independence. Um, and it'll be interesting to see how this pretty um, ideologically and morally bankrupt government handles that and of tries course. to push back on it and defend the, the United Kingdom as a sort of uh, a beneficial organisation. Yeah. How how COVID-19 affected you personally? This is my last question and we can finish sure. with this yeah. kind of uh, conversation. How it was, COVID-19, um, really, as, because you used to travel and you used to go out of the UK, affected you and... Mm. And you're coming. Yeah, and I'd I'd hope to I'd hope to come back to Jordan and carry on research, which obviously mm -hmm. wasn't possible. Um, I'd hope to do all sorts of things. 
at the same time, I, I have to say, you know, personally, I'm very lucky. Uh, I, I, I live with, um, with my wife, Jenny. Um, yeah. So, you know, I'm not, I'm not lonely. I was a bit financially exposed to it because I finished my PhD at a time when I imagined I'd easily be able to get a job, but because of the economic situation and the lockdown, it took a long time and I'm still only working part-time. Um, and also it's probably damaged my, uh, uh, my academic prospects in terms of universities have, have reduced funding and, and, and will be hard up for quite a while. Um, but at the same time, on the whole, you know, I'm, I'm fine. And I've, I've been very lucky. I haven't lost anyone close. Um, mm -hmm. My elderly parents are fine. Um, touch wood so far. Um, many people haven't been. And I think, I think one thing we've seen is that this sort of the, the, the tragedy of losing people hasn't been evenly spread. It, it's clumpy and, it, and, and, and you get clumps of, of people losing a lot of people um and i haven't been in one luckily um i i think in some ways lockdown for me came about last time in march uh just when i needed to really focus on finishing my phd so in some ways i was already very internalized and i was already expecting several months yeah. of sort of sitting quietly at home writing of course. So, <laughs> uh in some ways it didn't it, i didn't have to come to terms with a radically different sort of um expectations for the, the 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 immediate future which some people did you know it was much harder for for instance for many of my friends who had jobs which they either lost or even if they were furloughed um suddenly you know being stuck at the house um when they weren't used to it um it was very very difficult for some people around here who um you know are elderly and and were told to self-isolate and were quite fearful and didn't necessarily um know anyone who could get their shopping for them and weren't set up to do online um you know to get online deliveries um so on the whole i was fine and very very lucky and, and my immediate family and friends have all been fine but i'm sort of not complacent about that i guess uh, of course and i think actually i'm Nobody quite glad to now. be complacent <laughs> with the current situation because <laughs> it affects all kinds of uh, financial hmm. sectors Jordan yeah. lost, uh, I think the, the long-term economic side of it is what really worries me, and I think a lot of people think kind of crisis. regarding. Uh, I mean, if we talk about the Jordanian tourism, we lost uh, probably seven, eight uh, billion. Yeah, 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 and the destruction in other places, like uh, you know, the, the economic effects in uh, Lebanon are enormous. Yeah. The uh, situation in Yemen. What happened? Yeah. So I think I think that's the other thing. You know, we make a lot of the focus is on why has Western Europe and why have why has liberal Western Europe done so badly? But actually, that's a sort of that's what I mean by this kind of myopic view. It's it's just that we kind of expect things to go badly and for terrible things sure. to happen in other places. And actually, they have. It's been enormously destructive, and particularly the economic damage has been enormously sure. destructive throughout the world and and in many places where the state is less resilient, not necessarily through its own fault, but because flows of global capitalism and, uh, and, and um, access to, to credit just isn't there. Um, so yeah, I think uh, person, my, my, my personal situation, but also my sort of the situation of the UK, um, you know, we shouldn't be uh, we shouldn't be too sort of um, obsessed with that, that it's been especially bad here. I think it's 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 been bad everywhere in lots of different ways and we'll only really see the full economic damage in in in, in years maybe even decades to come in many places and i think that's the side that worries me more i'm fine now i mean i've got i've got i'm a, i'm working part-time i'm doing teaching in my university and i'm um i'm, I'm working on several yeah, articles you're considered and got, a lucky guy and I'm doing my COVID testing as well, which is is good because I get some income, but also because um, I've, you know, I, I it's quite interesting being involved in the response to the pandemic and seeing it from from the inside. Um, but longer term, I think we all feel a sense of uh, of deep anxiety and trepidation, and you know, we know that the 
the sort of uh, the climate crisis as it were is only just behind this crisis and yeah. even, even if we get through this there will be there will be worse things to come um, so i think uh, we might be optimistic about the future but it's hard to be joyful about it no a normal yeah. person cannot be joyful about no. the whole yeah. uh, situation regarding uh, covid-19 and uh, regarding all kinds of lockdown and Indeed. Um, I would like to stop at this point, and of course, we're going to continue in the future. I'm very happy that uh, you you maintain your sanity. You were very <laughs> Likewise. Likewise. positive, as always. And we're going to continue talking about not only COVID-19, but Jordanian um, anthropology and uh, Jordanian tribes. Thank yes, you so much for your time. Soon. I really appreciate uh, that you dedicated uh, your time to discuss all these issues, various issues, with myself. Thank you so it's much. It's been a pleasure, as always. I'll speak again soon. Thank you so much.